Hey guys, so I'm going to take a little bit of time to re-record uh, some of the things that we went over during the uh, recent Stub Club meetup. Uh, so we went through some of the material pretty quickly, uh, and being that this is the first time I've delivered it over Discord, it was a little bit crazy. Uh, so I'm going to try to slow down a little bit uh, without you know making the video too long, but to help you uh, understand some of the concepts that we talked about, as well as give you an opportunity to pause, think about it, maybe try some code, uh, and then come back to the video uh, later. So hopefully this helps you. Uh, give me some feedback uh, whether or not uh, you find that it was worth it, and we'll go from there. Okay, so if I move over to my desktop here, this is the same uh, you know, little presentation I gave before, so we'll just kind of walk through it again. All right, so a couple of things that we're going to talk about. Uh, what is programming? Uh, how do we write programs? Uh, what does it mean to be interpreted versus compiled? Uh, there's some language design uh, things that come up from time to time as you look at, at different languages. So if uh, you had used Java in one of your Minecraft mod kind of courses, Python will look a little bit different. But under the hood, there are some similarities, and we'll see that in some of the language design stuff we talk about. And then we'll cover Python itself. So we'll talk about some of the basic data types. We'll touch on container types, but in our uh, meetup, we didn't quite have time uh, to cover those. So I'll probably put those off again as well so that we can talk about them in, an, in another meetup. Uh, there are some keywords that we'll see in Python. Um, not too terribly important other than to recognize that certain words mean certain things to Python. And so we can't name our variables after some of those words. Okay. And then we'll talk about the REPL just a little bit because I think it's important in the beginning that you understand the REPL because this is where we're going to get to some of our documentation. Um, this is where we can try some things out uh, as we write our code. Okay, so what is a program? Well, anytime you're doing something on a computer that's repetitive, that's probably a good opportunity for you to automate that uh, into some kind of script or some type of program. Uh, additionally, our computers control a lot of different things. So we spend money online. You know, when you go to Amazon.com, there's a lot of things running in the background that make that work. Not only is there some code that runs in your browser, probably JavaScript, things like that. But once you, you know, make your order, you know, there are lots of different programs that run in the background to take that order, send it out, uh, move product around, things like that. So the Amazon knows, you know, which product you bought, where to ship it from, where to ship it to, you know, all of those different things. There's a piece of software that does all of that. Okay. And so those, obviously, you don't want uh, a person to have to handle every single order. Uh, so it, ne it needs to be a system that's repeatable and efficient. And so we write software in order to do that. Okay. So how is it written? Well, there, there's a concept of, as a human, I speak English, you know, I speak in words, I speak whatever language, you know, I grew up with, but a computer doesn't understand any of that. The computer only stand, understands ones and zeros. Either I have power or I don't have power, right? Um, and so we need something that's going to take what we understand in our language to something that the computer understands. And so there has to be some type of mechanism in order to do that translation from what humans speak to what computers speak. Well, the first way that you know we uh, can do that is with an interpreter. So in the case of Python, Python is a program that runs on your computer. And when you give it a Python script that's written in words, um, it takes that and translates that into bytecode that runs on your actual computer, right? So your uh, processor on your computer that kind of manages, you know, everything that's going on, it speaks in ones and zeros. And so this interpreter takes it from the English that we wrote out in our program 
into the ones and zeros that our processor understands. Now this process of being interpreted happens uh, as our program is running. As our program is running, it's going line by line through our program and translating each of those lines into some type of bytecode that then runs on the processor in our computer. Okay, and so that is true for Python and you know Ruby, Java that I've listed here. So there's quite a few languages that we write our code in some type of text file, and then we tell the interpreter to now run this code. Okay. Now there's a slight difference in other languages, and we consider them compiled, meaning that instead of happen to have some interpreter running on the computer that we're going to hand our code to, we basically uh, do that translation in the very beginning. So uh, in the interpreted way, we wrote code, we gave it to the interpreter, and as the interpreter is working line by line down our program, it's translating that to bytecode. In a compiled language, we do all of that translation ahead of time which means the result of that is that I have a program that I can now take and just run directly on that computer. That translation into something that the computer understands has already happened and it happens uh, via the compiler, right? Not an interpreter, a compiler. And so we only have to do that uh, compiling process a single time, okay? Whereas the interpreter, Anytime I run my program, the interpreter has to retranslate that to bytecode that runs on the computer, right? So your compiled languages tend to run faster because all of this work is done ahead of time to prepare it to run on the computer. Whereas in an interpreted language, it's having to not only run that on the processor, but do the translation right before it runs on the processor. So there's some extra steps that it has to take. And so it tends to slow the process down a little bit, but it's a little bit, you know, more flexible because we don't have to go through this, you know, compiling process. Okay. So the sum of the languages that you'll see, C, C++, Go, Rust, there's quite a few different languages that fall into this category. Now, I'm going to bring up my terminal here. And so my terminal, if I jump out of this folder, and I've got a folder here, and I have two programs in here. I have a hello program written in Python. So this is the hello.py. And I have a program written in C, hello.c, right? So two different languages here. And so we'll see, if I look at them, this is Python code. Um, we talked about in our meetup that this line you'll often see written in Python programs, and it basically instructs the computer, in my case, my Linux operating system, to when I run this program, to run it uh, with Python, right? And in particular, the Python 3 interpreter. There's two different versions. Python 3 is all we use now, right? Um, but it runs it in Python 3. Uh, and all of this program is going to do is print to the screen, hello, STEM club, right? And so if I quit out of here, the way that I run this is I tell Python, uh, go ahead and run the hello.py program. And it automatically interprets each of the lines that I wrote in there, in this case, just the print statement, and it uh, prints out hello STEM club to the screen, right? So all I needed was Python on this computer, and I tell Python to go ahead and execute this program. But again, this program is, oh, hello.py is just a text file, right? So it says, this is a Python script, it's ASCII text executable, right? So typically it will say that it's just ASCII text, but I have made this program also executable by setting an execution bit. Uh, we can talk about this later. The point is, is because I had that line at the very top of my program that says execute this with Python, I can execute it directly on my machine and it knows to use Python. So I can type in Python 
and the program name, or I can just type in the program name in this case, right? The point is, is that Python is translating this line by line as it executes it. It translates that into bytecode, which runs on my actual computer, right? Now, I mentioned there are two files in here. The other one is a C program, right? And if we look at that one, it doesn't look too terribly different uh, than our Python program. It's still going to print out uh, Hello STEM Club to our screen. But there's some extra things in here that are particular to the C programming language. But the point I want to get you to see is that I cannot run even if uh, I've made this executable, right? And don't worry about you know these extra commands I'm running. The point is, is that now I'm saying hello.c is an executable program. However, I can't just run it. There, there's nothing on my computer that understands this syntax directly. Whereas in this program, Python understands that and can run it directly. In this case, um, I really, I'm going to go ahead and remove execution on that one. But really, I need some other program to first compile this to something the computer can understand. And one of the things that we can do is there is a compiler called the GCC compiler. And this syntax just says, hey, uh, I want you to take the hello.c program and I want you to output a binary for hello. And so if I now uh, look, I now have this extra program. It is executable. And if I look at it with my file command, instead of just being a text file before, this is now uh, an elf which is just a an executable program on the Linux operating system. And so this is an executable program. And so now I can run hello and it runs just fine. So it outputs the same exact thing as my Python program. But I can run this as many times as I want and it will always do that. And I don't need another program on my machine anymore to do this compiling process. I only have to compile it one time, and now I have an executable that I can use. So that's the difference between an interpreted language and a compiled language. In a compiled language, you know, I ahead of time convert it to something that my computer can understand. Whereas in an interpreted uh, language, I have to have Python installed and it will take in my code, read it line by line, and begin doing that translation so that my computer can understand it, right? All right. So that's really the, the core difference there uh, between the two. Now, again, uh, we can't tell because it's, you know, these programs execute so quick, um, but the binary, the, the hello that I compiled will run faster than my Python program because I don't have to call some external program to do a translation and then do the thing I've asked it to do, right? But it's super simple. Uh, I can you know easily update my Python program by opening it back up, type a couple things in there, and re-execute it, right? And I don't have to worry about okay, I have to go back through this compilation process of compiling, you know, all those kinds of things. So it becomes handy. Um, but understand that there are drawbacks that it's going to run a little bit slower. Okay. Um, now, language design. So there are various uh, languages kind of fall into different categories. Some of them are considered high level. Some of are, some are considered low level, right? And we can kind of see that a little bit um, in the way that our C program looked and the way our Python program looked. So if I look again to hello.c, there's just little things that kind of come up. Like I have to include this slash n, which tells the computer, hey, this is a new line character and you should go ahead and do some type of like carriage return, go to the next line, right? Um, there are other things in here that you know I could get into. Uh, I have integers and on my computer, I have a 64-bit, uh, you know, machine. An integer is so many bytes 
and we can talk about this later, but it's so many bytes long based on the fact that I'm on a 64-bit system. Whereas if I was on a 32-bit system, the integers would be smaller. Now I can only store, you know, certain size numbers in it, right? So there's little things that come up from time to time in these lower level languages that where they're getting closer to the machine, right? They're written in a way uh, that uh, you can get really close to components in the machine, right? Whereas in my Python program, I didn't have to put that new line character for one. It's automatically going to happen. I didn't have to do any of that kind of setup work. I can just tell it exactly the thing that I want to have happen. And so we consider this a higher level language that it uh, makes it easier on the programmer, but it takes you farther away from the hardware that your computer is run or that your program is running on. So just wanted you to kind of see that uh, just so that we kind of get an understanding of some things that we're going to have to be very explicit about what we want it to do. And some of them, you can just kind of tell it roughly what you want to have happen and it will figure it out. So in this case, you know, I have the uh, idea of if you're telling your friend to make a sandwich, if we think of it from a high level, it's just, hey, go make a sandwich. If we think of it from the low level where a lower level language might exist, you may have to be a little bit more explicit about what you want to have happen. Go get some bread. Okay, you've got bread. Now go get some peanut butter. Now go get some jelly. How about get a knife? Now spread the jelly on one side, spread the peanut butter on the other side, and put everything back together, right? And you may have to be you know, explicit about what is the order that you want it to come back together so I don't end up with peanut butter on the outside and jelly on the outside, right? That would be a pretty messy sandwich, right? So the point is, is that a high level language kind of pulls you away from the hardware, allows you to just describe what you want and it, you know, makes it happen. Whereas a low level language, because we're really close to the hardware, I have to be very particular about what I want and how I want it, right? All right, object oriented. So C uh, was a language that is not object oriented, right? There are a lot of cool things we can do with the language, but at the end of the day, uh, it's very low level and they didn't build in objects to the language. Well, what is an object? An object is something that we can kind of build into and um, both nest data and the things that we want to work on that data with in the same object. So in this case, I describe a car, right? So an attribute of the car might be the number of doors, it might be the number of seats, the size of the motor, the fuel that it takes. Is it an electric car? Is it a gas car? You know, things like that. But then there are things we want to do with our car, right? We want to drive it. We want, before we drive it, we have to start it. You know, things like that, right? So there are attributes and there are methods or things that we want to have happen, right? In an object-oriented language, we have the ability to put that all in one nice little package and pass that thing around. So instead of having to pass data around and then also separately have some functions that work on that data, which is kind of how we work with uh, C, instead I can package this all up together. And so when I pass this one, oop, I hit my microphone here. Um, when I pass this around, now I not only have access to the data, but I have access to functions and methods that can work with that data, right? And so we'll see that uh, as a design kind of thing for the language, it is object oriented, right? And so we noticed that uh, during our meetup when we started working with strings. So if I look, I'll go out of that folder, um, so I've skipped over dynamic, um, but we'll kind of jump into our data types. And we had this string, right? And so we noticed when we worked with strings that uh, we just built them with the, uh, uh, the quotations, right? And that defines this as a string. So when I assign it to a variable, named my string and I could name it whatever I want. Uh, I assigned it there. Python figured out, hey, 
this is a string and so it makes this a string, right? But there are things that I can do to that string. And so in my case, uh, I'm doing a dir on that string and this is how we found out what are all the things I can do with an, uh, a string object. One of the things that I could do with it is when I ran len for length uh, on my string, it ran one of the methods inside of there, which we'll see here in a second. But I can also access some of those methods directly by using split. I was able to split on some of the white uh, space characters. So here's what we should see. It's This program is going to run from top to bottom. I first create my string. I'm going to then print it out. So we should see I am a string printed to the screen. And then we should see all of the different uh, methods and, and things like that that we can do with our string. I'll see the length of the string because I'm running len printed to the screen. And then I'm going to go ahead and print uh, my string being split by white space characters. So let's go ahead and run this and see what it looks like. Okay, so we did get our string out. I am a string. Then we got all of the different methods and stuff that we can use with our string. And then we ran len on it. And so when we ran len on it, what it did is it called this len method. Okay. And then I ran split, which was this method. And it split on the white space character. So it split here. It split here and it split here, right? So I end up with a list, and I know we haven't talked about lists yet, but I end up with a list of I am a string, right? And so again, this is part of the object oriented nature, right? So it not only stores the value that we asked it to store, but it also brought in all of these methods that we can use with that data. So when we ran len, it went in, ran the len function or the len method. The len method counted the number of characters that we assigned uh, to my string. And so it printed it out. And then when we ran the split method, it went in, looked at the data that was assigned to our string, and it went ahead and looked for white space characters, and it split on those characters, right? And so we ended up with a list of those things, right? So again, this is a pairing of our data and our methods, or the, the things that we want to do with that data, right? Are all in the same object. All I did was called it uh, my string. But now, uh, because I assigned an actual string to it, I can do all of these things with it. It's just built into the language. And that's part of the power of an object-oriented language. Okay? So not all languages are object-oriented. So C is not one of those languages. And so you don't get those kinds of things with it. And that's another part of being kind of a higher level language, right? Is I just get these things automatically and it's it's kind of nice. All right. Now, dynamically typed. So we're jumping back uh, in my folder structure because I got them out of order. Uh, but essentially, uh, I didn't have to tell uh, Python that my string was a string. I didn't have to tell um, when we did our meetup that when we assigned a an integer to something that, hey, this is an integer. Well. There are other languages out there that are statically typed. In those languages, you have to tell it, you know, uh, what language you're working or, you know, which data types you're working with. So if I clear my screen here and I'll go back, I can jump into my dynamic folder that I created. And I have two programs here. I have a C program that is this is how we do things the static way. And then I have a Python program that is a dynamic representation. Now, I've pre-compiled this. 
uh, the C program so we don't have to go through that uh, compiling process. But let's take a look at how Python does things. Okay, in Python, I just assign 1.99 to price. I assign five to quantity. I do some type of mathematical operation on that, assign that to a third variable, and then I print it out, right? Um, and so later on, we'll talk about what this looks like and, and what these extra brackets are for. Um, but suffice to say, all I'm doing is doing some type of mathematical operation, assigning the result of that to total price, and I'm gonna print that result to the screen. And then down here, I want you to see what are the different types that are associated with price? What is the type for quantity? And what is the type for total price, right? So I didn't tell it what the types were, but Python is gonna automatically infer that based upon what I'm trying to assign to that variable, okay? So let's go ahead and run it, Python 3, dynamic. And what we see is it did the math. Uh, the math came out to say, hey, I'm $9.95. And so the price, this $1.99, it came out to a float. And the reason that it's a float is because I gave it a decimal point. We have quantity. Quantity was an integer, int. And that's because I gave it a five and five did not have a decimal point. The result, because I'm multiplying a floating point number to an integer, it resulted in a floating point number, a number that also had a decimal point, okay? So I'm getting these sorts of things automatically or dynamically uh, in the Python language. If I look at static, oops, not that one. How about static.c? I tried to look at the binary itself, which doesn't make sense to me, but it makes sense to the machine, right? Because there's a bunch of ones and zeros that can execute on the machine. And in this case, I, I have the same exact problem that I did before, except now in this statically typed uh, arena, uh, statically typed language, I have to tell it what I want. So price is gonna be a floating point number. Quantity is going to be an integer. Total price will also be a floating point number. And then when I print it out, I have to tell it what, uh, what to expect. So in this case, total price is a float. And so I have to tell it with this special kind of syntax that what you're going to receive in here in this format statement is a float, right? So these are things that you'll typically see with a statically typed language. I have to tell it, you're a float, you're an int, you're this type, you're that type. Um, and I didn't have to do that with Python. So when I run uh, static, I get the same output. Total price, $9.95. So it worked just the same, except I have to be very explicit about the data types that each variable has, right? Now, there are good things about being uh, dynamically typed. There are bad things about being dynamically typed. And we'll run into some of those edges from time to time as we're troubleshooting our code that we were expecting uh, a variable to have a certain data type which has certain attributes or certain methods. But maybe we messed up our code somewhere and we assigned a different uh, value to this variable and that changed its type. In statically typed uh, area, you can't change the type of a variable, right? Once you create it, once you've told it that I'm a float, it will always be a float. Uh, there are ways of doing some crazy stuff in the background, but, but for our case, a float, it will always be a float, right? In Python, because it's dy dy dynamically typed, I can change its type as I go. And sometimes that's good, sometimes it leads to mistakes in our code, right? But that's how the language was designed, okay? So Python, in the end, is an interpreted language. It's high-level, object-oriented, and dynamically typed. And so hopefully you have a better understanding of what that means 
So as we look at other languages, we kind of get a sense of why this is important, why that's not important, right? Okay, so basic data type. We've already seen some already. We've seen our integers. We've seen floating point numbers. Uh, we didn't see complex numbers, but I'm not going to cover that in this one. But understand they are there uh, for certain types of, of uh, operations. You may need imaginary numbers uh, or imaginary components, right? Strings we've also seen, and they just have the different quotes on the end of them uh, to define this as a string. The last thing here is a Boolean uh, variable, right, or type, right? And so this could be true or false. And so typically uh, we'll see a Boolean as the result of some type of comparison. So if I come back here, let me move back. And I've got basic data types again. And I've got a bool.py. So let's take a look at that. So in, in here, I'm not necessarily uh, assigning true or false to something, but I am making some type of evaluation, right? So I've assigned a variable age and I've given it 17. So this age is an integer, right? And then I'm going to perform some type of evaluation. Is age greater than this little caret here? Uh, because the big end is pointing this way. We're saying is age greater than 16? So 16 should be less than age, right? Well, we know that this is true. So 17 is greater than 16. So what we should see is that the evaluation of this would be true, right? So because this is an evaluation, when I look at its type, it should tell me that this is a Boolean because the result of this is going to be either true or false, which is Boolean, right? And so I can use then Boolean's in some type of if statement. So if age is greater than 16, so if the result of this is true, go ahead and print, you can drive. Otherwise, else, print, you cannot drive, right? And so what we should see is the type is Boolean, the result is true, and that this then prints out, you can drive. All right, so let's go ahead and run bool. And what we see is uh, we do in fact get a bool back. It is true. And so the first line of that true or if else statement comes back as you can drive, All right? So now we've seen integers, we've seen floating point, we've seen uh, strings, and we've seen Boolean operations. All right now containers i didn't talk about containers too much other than to say hey there are these uh other types that we can use that basically enable us to store store multiple values inside of them so in a list we can add remove items quickly so what that might look like and again i'm not going to go into great depth here because i want to cover this in a little bit more depth in a future one but we're going to go ahead and jump into our REPL, okay? Just like we saw on REPL.io, I can have a REPL here in my terminal because I have Python installed, okay? And so a list, if I do a dir to find out all the different things that I can do with a list, and I could say, hey, I want to know all the different things. I can see I can append, I can clear, I can copy, I can count the number of items that are in it, I can extend it, I can look up certain values. There's lots of different things I can do. So let's create a list. So we'll say uh, my list, and I'm going to use the square brackets because that's how I define a list. And I'm just gonna give it a couple different values. And I can even give it uh, a string in here. All right, and it happily takes all of those things. And so I can look, I do have a list and I can do uh, my 
list.count. Uh, let's see. Apparently I did that wrong. So let's look. Help. What is my list? What is count actually for? So count returns the number of occurrences of a value. So if I wanted to count the number of twos in there, it would say that I have one two in there. In my mind, I was actually thinking len of my list. That's what happens when you talk and type at the same time. But what we could see there are five items in our list, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and I can look to see how many, you know, uh, how many times two exists in our list. Now what happens, I could also do a my list dot append, right? So this is one of our methods up here and I can append a two to it. So now when I look, I have a two at the very end. And if I up arrow to where I'm going to count again for two, I'll see I do in fact have two twos in my list, right? Okay, so there are lots of these different data types in there that I can use that enable me to do uh, different things, right? And again, I want to cover them a little bit more in depth in a, a future kind of session, so I won't cover them all. But a list, again, just makes it so that I can add and remove items very quickly. A tuple uh, feels like a list, but once I create a tuple, it can't be changed, okay? And so oftentimes you'll see tuples as a return from some type of function that you write. A set is pretty cool. Uh, I drew this, um, let me see if this will come up. Yep, so I drew this, picture in uh, our little meetup where you have a set here. And so this could be, you know, one, two, three, four, five, 5,000, just uh, whatever item is in there, right? So lots of different items, just like we had in our list, we can put things in a set. But the cool thing about the set was, is that we can do a comparison from that set to another set, all right? So I now have another group of all these values. And so now I can find what is the, intersection between these two sets or i can look at what is the union of these two sets so all of the values that exist between the two sets there's lots of different kind of comparisons that i can do um, another thing with sets is uh you can um you can assign values to it multiple times but a set will only uh, make that assignment if it's a unique value. If it doesn't already have that value in there, you know, it, you know, will only do it. So you end up with a very, uh, a, a set of all the unique things that you've done, right? And so it's, it's kind of cool in that respect. A dictionary, on the other hand, allows you to uh, use what's called key value pairs. And so I can assign, um, some value a key and so when i need to look that value up all i have to do is search for its key right and this will become uh, important to us because it's very fast to look up values by this key um, and so we'll see dictionaries used quite a bit all right so let's uh, it looks like my powerpoint is frozen so that's exciting. Oh, maybe it's because I have my drawing thing. Yep, I have my drawing thing still up. So reminder to myself to turn that off next time. Okay, so standard library. Python comes with a large library of modules to do all sorts of things, right? So I gave some examples here, but this is by no means even close to the number of things that you can do. And the point is, is that uh, Python is one of those languages that People have built things with it for for long, long periods of time. And a lot of those things, when they when the maintainers of the language find that something is used quite a bit and uh, that thing is pretty stable, meaning it's not seen tons and tons of changes, they'll include it in the core part of the language. And so we can automatically pull some of those things in. So in our case, we're just going to pull in 
a random module. So if I look here, I can go to zero four and I'll open up random int, right? And so in my case, I have uh, in the language, it already had this thing called random. And in order for me to use it, all I have to do is import it. And so I have this import statement and then I name the module that I want to import and then I can go and use it. So in my case, random.randint uh, and then I give it two numbers. So this is the lowest number in the, in the uh, group that I want to generate and then this is the highest number that I would potentially generate, right? And so what I see is when I run it, I print out a number. So seven, one, three, nine. So you can see it just generates random numbers. So I didn't have to figure out um, how to tell the machine, hey, I need a random number, right? All I had to do was import the random module. Somebody had already written a rand int um, method or function. And so all I have to do is run that function, give it some parameters, and it outputs and it works. So again, I get this all for free in the language. And random is just one module. There are, there are tons and tons of modules, right? But it's really cool that uh, we have all of that to work with just by having Python, right? Um, and so there are modules to do all sorts of different things and we'll definitely see various modules used uh, throughout our club. Now there are keywords that, um, you know, mean something to Python, right? So in our case, when I want to do a loop, um, I can do four, right? Uh, I can also do a loop with while. Uh, when I start doing exception handling, like I'm trying, I think there might be an error here or some kind of condition could cause my program to crash. I can use a try statement. And then at the bottom of that try statement, uh, I would have an accept. Uh, so there's all of these uh, different words, again, that mean something to the uh, Python programming language, right? And that means that, I shouldn't try to use these uh, in um, in some type of an assignment. So, in case, uh, in just to kind of point that out, we had the while uh, is a keyword. So this is how I perform some type of loop. But what if I wanted to make a, a variable called while? So while equals five. Automatically, it throws a fit. It says whoa, whoa. whoa. This is invalid syntax, right? Um, and so this is because while is a keyword and so I can't make an assignment to it, right? So that's all I wanted to point out there was that we have these various pieces that we're gonna see used over and over again as we use the language, all right? And then you've already seen me use it a couple of times here, the REPL, right? So the REPL, isn't available in every language, um, but I find it to be very, uh, very handy, very powerful uh, in Python. So just by typing Python at our prompt, we can open it up. And the arrows and all of this kind of indicates, hey, you're inside this REPL. And so I can do code in here. I can do my string equals Hello. Just like we did in our code before, we can do the same thing here. And this enables me to then kind of look at well, what are the things I can do with my string. And if I wanted help on figuring out, uh, just like when we did that list.count, uh, oh, I also have a count here as well. So what does that do? I can do a help on my string.count, and that will bring up help documentation on what does this method actually do? Well, it returns the number of non-overlapping occurrences of a substring in string. Uh, so uh, we could put some type of substring and let's try that. So my string was hello. And so if I did a count, um, we'll put in LL. It would say that, well, there is an occurrence of LL in there, right? So 
Uh, if I had maybe a longer thing, we could test out other things. But the point is, is that I can try things out here in the REPL. I can find documentation inside the REPL. Um, and that helps me kind of work through some of my uh, code to figure out, you know, maybe I made a mistake somewhere because I don't quite understand how something works, or maybe I just needed to look up how to use a method and then go back to my program and write it there, right? All right, and then to exit it, we just type in exit or quit. It does expect these brackets, and that exits us out of the REPL, okay? And so, this was our opportunity then to go and do some code. Uh, if I slide up the uh, way that we were doing code during the club meetup was with REPL.IT. So I I would you know invite you to go take a look at it. It's free, um, but what it will do is make sure you don't have to install Python on your machine, but you can still use Python as you learn through your web browser, right? And so all I have to do is log in uh, to REPL. I can click the Python tab. It's gonna ask for some type of name. It generates some weird ones for you. Uh, you can change it if you want. Otherwise, you go ahead and here's our program. Here's our REPL. We have a shell right here. So just like I've been bringing up my shell right here, uh, this is the same thing. It's just inside your browser. It's running in the cloud, right? And so we have our REPL here so that we can look up documentation. Otherwise, we could open up a tab and just kind of Google it, right? Um, but we can do the same things we did before. So we had print hello stem club, all right? And so if I hit run, it's going to look for a program called main.py and it's going to go ahead and execute that and we see hello stem club, right? So I invite you to play around with it. This supports lots of different languages. Um, in our case, we'll be doing obviously Python uh, inside of it. All right. So you don't have to, again, have Python installed locally. You can do it inside your browser and kind of follow along uh, with some of the examples, right? So I handed out a couple of challenges in the uh, meetup. So one was to see the available functions inside the random module, right? So if I bring up my terminal, uh, we've got 05 challenges and I didn't write any so that we could work through them together. So I'm gonna go ahead and open a program. Well, in this case, I'll just bring up the REPL, right? We'll make this easy, right? So we have Python. I'm going to go ahead and import random. And then I'm going to go ahead and do a dir on random, right? And this will tell me all of the different things I can do, right? And so in our case, uh, in one of the earlier examples, we called the rand int function right here, right? So we reference random. Uh, the module and then the function inside the module that I want to run and I get a random integer. Now the other way that I can do this is I can be very particular about which functions I want to pull in. So instead of pulling all of these in, I can just pull in exactly. So we can do from random import rand int. And so this just pulls in the rand int function. And so now I don't have to say random.randint. I can just do rand int. And it will generate a number for me, right? So two different ways of kind of importing. So you can just import the whole module and that will bring in all of the functions, all of the classes, you know, anything that's inside that module. Or I can just get uh, you know, more focused and this is exactly which function, which class, which, you know, whatever inside this module that I want. And so I do that with from module name import, you know, what it is I'm trying to import. Okay. So that one wasn't too bad because we've seen some of those examples so far. Um, so again, 
There's your answer. We just import random and we can do a dir on random, right? And if we wanted to look at some of the doc or the help documentation for it, we could also type in help and random. And the next portion was how do we actually use it? So we've seen the random uh, module used to generate integers so far. So I'm just going to skip ahead from random import rand int. So we just saw that used and then we called it rand int the lowest number and then the highest number potentially, right? And so it'll go ahead and generate a number for us. The last part, we didn't uh, touch on this in the um, meetup because we haven't really talked about writing functions yet, but this one was to write a function called roll dice. And so we'll we'll experiment this as, uh, with this as we go forward. Writing a function, passing things into that function, having it do something, and then return to us the result, okay? So I'm gonna call it here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead uh, and kind of sign off here. Uh, I just wanna thank you for participating in the STEM club. I wanna thank you for taking the time to kind of learn some Python. Hopefully it was interesting to you. Hopefully you learned something from it. Uh, as we move forward, we'll figure out, you know, what works best in this kind of digital, um, you know, kind of area, this virtual kind of learning. Um, but then eventually, you know, we'll come back together and start working on this, uh, hopefully together, right? So again, signing off. Thanks for watching and uh, have a good week.